You know, we're always hearing about how good God is. And uh, when we're preaching, I hope we're always talking about how good God is. I, I certainly hope that's our main focus rather than talking about how much harder we need to try or how terrible a state the world is in or anything like that. Now, our focus is and should be how good God is. And when Paul tries to get his head around the goodness of God, he writes this uh, in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It's incredibly deep words, and he's talking about a very profound goodness, and I hope the words come across there and that you can feel how strongly Paul felt this. And yet, <clears throat> we're so easily distracted from him, aren't we? We so easily go off in other directions and do other things and give our best thoughts and attention to other things. So today I want to look at why that is. And this uh, really helpful parable really lays it out. Uh, well, big surprise, the words of Jesus turn out to be wise. Okay, let's pick it apart uh, and we'll see what it says and what it has to say to us here and now. So here's how the story begins. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But the guests all began making excuses. One said, I've just brought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, what's going on here? So th what this parable is telling us, the whole thing is a picture of God's goodness and his generosity to every one of us. And of all the reasons that we overlook that and go and do other things instead. So, so what are the th three things are laid out here? Three excuses that people give for not coming. First one, do you remember the guy says, I've just brought a field and I must inspect it. Now here we've got somebody who doesn't just have possessions, but his possessions have him. You know, it's lovely for him that he's got a field, but actually what's happening is the field is coming between him and God. And that can easily happen with us, can't it? You know, the things that we care about having, uh, making the house nicer or buying a better car or uh, uh, some people I know always want to buy another guitar. You know, these, these they're not bad things, but when they come between us and God, when we prioritise them ahead of him, we miss out on his goodness. Now, here's the second one. second person says, I've just put five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Now, what's going on with this guy? He's working. Uh, and he's not just doing a job because the job is, is useful and valuable. He's, the work has got him, hasn't it? Again, it's, it's in charge of him rather than him being in charge of it. He's got the oxen. He has to go and do things with them straight away. He's tied to his job. And again, I wonder how many of us find something similar happening. How easily we get drawn into defining ourselves by our work. And then the third one is really interesting. He says, I just got married, so I can't come. Now here is somebody who is putting his human relationships ahead of God. Now that doesn't sound so bad, does it? When we think about these three things, I think each of them is more defensible than the one before. So we can all look at the first person who's just obsessed with his obsessions and what things he owns and say, oh, yes, that's not the way to be. And maybe we look at uh, the person who's just too taken up with his work and think, well, that's more understandable. Uh, and then when we look at the relationships person, the guy who just got married and says he can't come for that reason, I think we probably tend to be much more sympathetic with him and think, well, OK, maybe there's something in that. But here's the thing. Uh, it's not the possessions are bad or work is bad or relationships are bad. It's that Jesus demands to be ahead of all of them. Even ahead of our marriages, you might ask? Well, yeah, because our marriages best thrive when we seek God, when we're looking first for God. In fact, uh, Jesus says exactly that, doesn't he? In Luke's gospel, he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. Now, 
the premise here is it's it's a really surprising one really it's, it's saying that if you really care about your possessions or about your work or about your relationships about your marriage about your children the best way you can bring blessing on all of those areas is by looking for god first why because god is more good than any of those things so this is not a sacrifice that we're being asked to make we're not being told if you want to be a good Christian, you've got to put these other things aside and, and do without them and, and be very austere and very disciplined and seek God instead. No, no, it's it's just solid good sense. It's in our interests to look for God because God is good. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. Uh, he writes, we are half hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So what am I saying? Am I saying it's, it's not okay to have good things? No, I'm not saying that. And we can see it in the Bible, in the New Testament. Uh, it's good to have possessions and good jobs and good relationships. Think about possessions. Matthew, who was one of Jesus' disciples, was a tax collector. He would have had plenty of money. Uh, Lydia, the first convert in the province of Asia, was a merchant in purple cloth. She ran her own business. Uh, and then think about people with prestigious jobs and who would have been very involved with their jobs. Luke, who wrote the gospel we're reading now, was a doctor in his day job. Uh, you can't get a much more respected job than that, can you? Uh, except perhaps in that particular culture, uh, early uh, Jews, when Paul uh, who wrote a lot of the letters we read was actually a rabbi which is about the most respected of all jobs again nothing wrong with those jobs and then think about people in good relationships in the new testament uh, aquila and priscilla for example uh, were a married couple who uh, were teachers and preachers and the apostle peter who uh, was one of jesus's closest disciples uh, we read that later on uh, after the resurrection when peter traveled around from church to church he took his wife with him so look this is good. It's good to have nice things. It's good to have good jobs and worthwhile jobs. It's good to be in good relationships. The problem with all of these things, well, there are two problems. There are two dangers we can fall into with these things. Even though they're good things, they become bad for two reasons. One of them is the danger that we slip into thinking that the reason God approves of us uh, is because we're pretty special people because we, we've acquired all these good things or because we've got this really good job or because we're in such good relationships, bringing up our children well, something like that. Now, we'll come back to that and look at that later. But the other problem with all of these things, possessions, jobs, relationships, remember that are good in themselves. They become a bad thing when we put them ahead of God. And to go back to C.S. Lewis again, he had a really clear way of thinking about this stuff. He talks about first and second things, things of first importance, and things of second importance. And he wrote this in a, a letter to a friend in 1951. Put first things first and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first and we lose both first and second things. We never get, say, even the sensual pleasure of food at its best when we're being greedy. You see what he's saying? So one reason why we should prioritise God even ahead of our marriages and our children and certainly our jobs and our possessions is because seeking God first, looking for him first of all, is the best way to get a good marriage and to bring your children up well and to have a, a worthwhile job and to do well in it. So we've talked about the danger that we can follow our possessions or work or relationships in a way where they lead us away from God. What's the alternative to that? Well, let's read on through the story of the banquet. Uh, so here we are in verse 21. The servant returned and told his master what the guests had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. The poor, the cripple, the blind and the lame are the people who get invited to the banquet. Now look, that's us. <laughs> or we better hope it is. You know, in this story, there are only two groups of people. 
They are the ones who were first invited and who rejected the invitation and missed out on God's goodness. And there's the second group who accept it. And they are the ones described as poor and crippled and blind and lame. Now look, we're told that the people in the first group, he says, none of those I invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. We don't want to be in that group. So are we are among the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. You know, we might think we're pretty special. We might think I own my own house. I've got an expensive car. I've got a good job. I run my own business. I bring my children up well, any of those things. And yet the people who receive the blessing of God in this story are the ones described as the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And perhaps we're thinking, oh, it's the deserving poor. Uh, this story is about those who no fault of their own are poor and crippled and blind and lame and they're victims of society uh, and they're good people. And finally, God is giving them what they deserve. But no, that's not what it says at all. Uh, the, the telling of this story in Matthew's gospel says, really spells it out. He says, the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. Now look, some of us are coming to God, I hope we are, as poor, as crippled, as blind, as lame, and even as bad. We're not even good people who have all those disadvantages. We're bad people who have those disadvantages. Guess what? That's why it's so important that what God gives us is a gift. It's not a reward. It's not in response to something we've done. It's just a reflection of his goodness, of his character. That's why it's so important to remember that we don't get into the kingdom of God because of our own achievements, however good they are. Here's what Brennan Manning said. This is worth listening to and absorbing. It's short, but it's powerful. Christianity, he says, is not primarily a moral code, but a grace-laden mystery. It is not essentially a philosophy of love, but a love affair. It's not keeping rules with clenched fists, but receiving a gift with open hands. Now look, we get into the banquet by God's grace, by God's goodness. And there's more. We don't stay in because of how well we respond to God's calling. We stay in how? Exactly the same way, by grace, by the goodness of God. Do you know, sometimes I think about the, the prayer of the Pharisee. Do you remember Jesus uh, tells the story of a, para, of a Pharisee and um, uh, an innkeeper who are both praying? And the Pharisee, it says in Luke's Gospel again, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Look, that was his idea of coming to God. Just trying to impress God with how, with what a good guy he is. And do you know what he's like in that situation? I always think of this as um, a, a person trying to impress God is like uh, an ant trying to impress a zookeeper. So, this ant may be very impressed with himself and the ant says, behold my polished chitinous exoskeleton and I can exude pheromones that send up to six different messages and I'm so mighty that I exceed my fellows in length by nearly half a millimetre. And he might be very, very impressed by all this. Maybe even the other ants are impressed, but he's still an ant. The zookeeper is not going to be impressed by the ant. And if we approach God like that Pharisee, trying to impress him, with how great we are, we're just ridiculous. And yet again, we don't have to do that. We don't have to impress God. We come to him as poor, as crippled, as blind, as lame. Do you know, there may be no single person after uh, the Bible was written who had more influence on Christianity than Martin Luther, uh, the monk who was... Uh, at the heart, really, of the Reformation, of the rediscovery of true Christianity. And his very last written words, as he was lying in bed, uh, dying and knowing he was dying, he gestured for someone to bring him pen and paper, and he wrote these words, although he wrote them in German. His final words, we are all beggars. This is true. After a life lived, seeing God and knowing God and loving God and serving God, if anybody at that stage in his life could have said, Do you know, I've really earned my place in the kingdom of God. I'm a profitable servant. Well done thee. God must be impressed. He would be the person who could say that. 
But he doesn't say that. He says the opposite. Do you know, the deeper he goes into the goodness of God, the more he understands how good God is and how incredibly privileged we are to receive from him. And it's so important we remember this because the one thing that can take us out of God's goodness, that can stop us from receiving his kindness, is if we just consider ourselves above it and stop coming to him and looking for it and just think he's going to be impressed by us. So, where have we got to? We've found three things that can divert us away from God. Uh, our possessions, our jobs and our relationships. And we've seen how important it is to keep him at the centre, to seek him first, and then all those other things come to us. Uh, and we've also seen how important it is that we don't ever slip into thinking that we receive God's goodness as, as a reward for what fine people we are. But then how do we respond to all of this? We, re we return to God over and over again for more grace than what follows. How do we react to that? Well, the last couple of verses of this story of the banquet tell us, and I'll read them to you. After the servant had brought these people in, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Now listen, there is still room for more. This is always true, isn't it? It never stops being true. Uh, God's banquet never runs out of space. There are never too many people there for him to... Be kind to all of them, to be generous to all of them, to bring his goodness to all of them. There's always room for more. This is why evangelism is important. You know, if we're Christians, what is a Christian? I would say it's someone who has received the gift of goodness from God and accepted that gift. The gift of forgiveness, the gift of grace. And if we've got a gift, and if we understand how good that gift is, then we want other people to have it too. And I hate the idea of Christians who are kind of uh, evangelists by guilt because they feel that they've, they've, they've got to, to do their duty, you know, in, in, in telling other people the gospel or trying to get other people to sign up to some kind of church thing. No, that's not it. What it is, is this. God is good. And if we've seen that, and if we love people, we want other people to have that goodness. There's still room for more. And that's always true. You know, sometimes we hear the analogy that the church is like a hospital. And the reason that's a helpful way to think is because uh, people might look at the church and say, oh, the people in there are all so broken. Obviously, the church is no use. Uh, but no, of course, the, the people in the hospital are ill. Uh, and nobody for that reason says the hospital's no good. You go to a hospital because you're ill. And similarly, uh, people who understand their need for God are the ones who come to a church. So it, it's a useful analogy. It's a good way to think about the church. But here's one way that I think it doesn't quite work. In a hospital, there's a clear distinction. There are two groups of people, aren't there? There are the people who are sick, the patients, and there are the people who are able to help them. That's the doctors and the nurses. And you're one or other of those two things. But that's not how it is in the church. There are two things we've got to realise in the church. One of them is we are all sick. We are always, always in need of healing. We're always and forever in need of coming back to God, of receiving more of him, of seeing him more clearly, of, of taking more and more of the goodness that he offers us. But it's also true that we are all doctors and nurses in the hospital. Uh, that is, in the church, in this analogy of a hospital, we're all doctors. We're all called to help other people as well. We're not just lying there in our sick beds. We're not just receiving kindness from others, but we're also having been given power by God, having been given goodness, having been the recipients of his kindness, then we're also the doctors who help to bring the blessing to everybody else around us. Do you know, there's a very famous quote that uh, people attribute to lots of different sources. It seems like it comes from uh, a missionary called D.T. Niles, and I'm going to read it to you. He says, a Christian witness is not like a rich man, who has a lot of bread, which he hands out to poor beggars who have nothing. He is rather like one beggar who tells another beggar where he has found bread. Now, I think that's really beautiful. That is who we are. 
we are beggars who have found bread and who are helping others to see where we found it. But my only quibble with this quote is that he's just talking about bread. But actually the analogy Jesus uses is not just bread, it's a banquet. It's all the good stuff. It's all your meats and cheeses and wines or uh, if you're vegan, whatever uh, equivalent that would be, uh, exotic nuts and, and pulses. Uh, it's good stuff. It's all the good things. It's not just bread. It's everything that we want and need. It's the great, great deep goodness of God. And I want to finish with this one brief verse from 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul just kind of gives up on, on trying to explain it and just says this, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You know, we don't see it clearly most of the while. We just see this distorted image, like a, a reflection in a distorted mirror. But we know the truth of this. That what God has prepared for us, and even what he has for us now, is so much greater than what we see. That banquet is there. The invitation is there. We are called to come and eat, but also to bring others with us to experience that same fantastic blessing that God has for us and for them. What a great God. What a good God.